Hi, my name is Dr. Adam Manley, and for this session we're going to talk about a really important topic, and that is safety. So the agenda for this session is the following. We're going to talk about hand and power tool safety, plumbing and HVAC safety procedures, general job site safety, fire prevention, PPE, material handling, excavation, electrical safety, scaffolding and ladder safety, and motor vehicle safety. Since many tools are made to increase our muscle force, they must be used carefully or we risk being badly hurt. Improper use of tools can also hurt other persons around us or damage property. Using tool safety is only part of the obligation of a professional plumber or HVAC technician. Our construction projects on construction projects, there are many more risks than, than those encountered doing repair work in home offices. Regardless of the setting, be alert to hazards of all types. Many tools are designed to meet industry safety standards. Check for seals and other information attesting to the safety status of the tool. Carefully read and observe operating instructions. Check each tool for condition to make certain that all the parts are intact and do not use a broken tool or any tool that appears to be unsafe. So let's talk a little bit about common tool safety practices. The first one is inspect tools daily to ensure that they are in proper, properly working order. If not, return them to the tool room immediately. Power saws, grinders, and other power tools must have proper guards placed on them at all times. Power tools should be hoisted or lowered by the hand line, never by the cord or the air hose. Cords and hoses must be kept out of walkways and off stairs and ladders. They must be placed so they do not create a tripping hazard. Electrical powered tools and other equipment must be grounded when it's being used. Also, hand tools should be used for their intended purposes only. The design capacity of hand tools should never be exceeded by unauthorized attachments. When using power tools, always use additional PPE specified under OSHA standards. If you have a question about the, the type of protective equipment you should use or safety rules, always ask the su job site supervisor. An approved safety check valve must be installed on, at the manifold outlet of each supply line for any type of handheld pneumatic tools. All pneumatic hose connections must be fastened securely. All fuel power tools must be shut down while being refueled. Smoking is prohibited when refueling, op when refueling operations. Now when it comes to some generic kind of rules and safety practices for plumbing and HVAC, obviously the first one is, is that safety is number one. Also, accidents, not only do they cause pain, suffering, and personal loss for the individual and the family, but they also cost time away from the job, worker compensation, insurance costs, and lost production on the job. So it's incredibly important that we always comply to OSHA standards. Now when it comes to on-the-job type safety, the first thing is you need to analyze the job from the standpoint of safety. Be sure that you have all your protective equipment before you start a job. If you're in doubt of what you need, consult your supervisor. Any unsafe condition should be reported to the supervisor immediately. Also, all injuries must be reported to your supervisor. Absenteeism should be reported to your supervisor prior to the start of the shift. If, if your absence is due to a work incurred injury or illness, a report must be filed with the insurance carrier immediately. So you need to consult your supervisor if this is the case. Horseplay, mischief, and fighting are not tolerated on any job site. Employees must never come to work in possession of or under the influence of alcohol or unauthorized drugs. Use of prescription medicines that carry a warning against driving or operating machinery should be reported to your job site supervisor so that less demanding work could be assigned to you. Each employee must comply with all posted non-smoking signs on every job site. There's a reason that they're there. Hair must be kept away from machinery. 
Longer hair should be kept under a hard hat or secured in another way so it cannot become entangled in machinery. Flammable products such as hairspray should not be used if, the, if you are working with or near any flammable products such as torches on the job site. And then finally, do not wear torn, loose, or frayed clothing or, or accessories that can catch in machinery or material. And of course, shirts should be tucked in. Continuing with job site safety, each employee is responsible for the cleanliness of their work area. This means proper storage and return of tools, equipment, and material, as well as cleanup of scrap, dirt, or grease. Clear access must be maintained at all times to work areas and walkways. Keep the floors and the loading areas clear of any slipping or tripping hazards. Air, hose, air hoses must not be kinked so that we control the flow of air. Horse play with air hoses is not permitted, obviously. Compressed air injected into the body can be very painful to the recipient, so therefore we must not use compressed air on clean clothing. Defective or worn equipment should be reported to your supervisor with a request for repair or maintenance. Defective tools should be returned to the tool room for replacement. And of course, as we mentioned before, do not exceed the limits of any machine or tool. Entry to electrical and compressor areas should be restricted to authorized personnel only performing specific assignments. Control panels should be closed and left alone. Only personnel designated by the foreman and other supervisors are permitted to operate controls. Cranes and yard equipment must be operated only by per personal, personnel authorized to do so by their supervisors. Never stand or walk under a moving or suspended load. Flammable substances, including paints, cannot be stored inside the main buildings except as authorized. Thinners that we use for pipes or parts cleaning should be issued in quantities not exceeding one gallon in an approved container and should be used in a well-ventilated area to prevent buildup of explosive or toxic fumes. And then never s smoke or have open fires during refueling because igniters need to be turned off so that we prevent explosions. Radioactive areas must be barricaded and posted with radiation hazard sign. Keep clear of these areas when x-ray work is, is in progress. Heed all warnings. They are there for your protection. Also, for your protection, obey all signs such as keep out, no smoking, eye protection required, and authorized personnel only. Sliding down ropes and cables and guides is strictly f forbidden. Never jump onto an elevated surface. And then finally, the handling of explosives is, is extremely dangerous. On all work of this nature, you should always consult your foreman. Now let's spend a little time talking about fire prevention. Most often, ABC fire extinguishers will be available on the job site for all firefighting needs. Every employee must be familiar with the location of all firefighting equipment on the job site. Preventing fires on the job site involves awareness and the ability to follow through with safety work practices that minimize the risk of fire. First, keep the work area neat to reduce fire and accident hazards. Be sure to handle flammable and combustible liquids only in approved, properly labeled safety cylinders. And finally, do not, open, do not use open fires on the job site unless specifically authorized by the responsible supervisor. Use only approved solvents for cleaning and degreasing. The use of gasoline or similar flammable products for this purpose is always prohibited. After cleaning and degreasing, place oily rags in approved covered metal containers. When welding or burning must occur near combustible materials, move the materials to a safe distance or cover them with fire-resistant fabric or wet them down. When in doubt, consult your job site supervisor. PPE, otherwise known as personal protective equipment, refers to any specialized clothing, helmets, eyewear, or other gear designed to protect a worker's body from injury from a variety of hazards. As might be expected, the use of PPE is governed by OSHA standards. 
Some basic rules with PPE is to wear clothing suitable for the work being done. In the plumbing industry, this means a minimum of long pants and a t-shirt. Safety shoes and work boots with toe protection are also required. In addition, safety glasses must be worn in the areas for complete eye protection. Finally, anyone entering a designated hard hat area must wear a hard hat. Some common PPI, PPI items are the following. Hearing protection, respiratory equipment, lifelines, gloves, rubber boots, goggles, helmets, and shields, and eye protection. When it comes to handling materials, it's important to understand that many of the materials used in plumbing and HVAC industry involve weights that can kill or cause permanent disability. Moving material around on a job site is a non-value added task. So plan your work carefully so materials are only moved when needed. When not, they should be stored in a safe and secure area that is out of the way of ongoing work. By learning and following safety practices for handling these materials and equipment, employees can help to prevent injury and safeguard lives. It is critical to know the approximate weight of the load and make certain the on-site equipment is actually rated to handle that. All power equipment and rigging is rated with safe working loads. Never exceed the manufacturer's recommended safe working load. And whenever possible, avoid moving loads by hand. Use cranes and hoists for awkward or heavy lifts. When using cranes and hoists, obviously there are some safety procedures to follow. Never stand, walk, or work under suspended crane hooks or loads. Riding on a crane hook, yard equipment, forks, or any other type of load is prohibited. Never run hand trucks or mobile equipment over hoses, cables, and welding leads. Always check your equipment before each use. If it shows any defects, guess what? Report it to your supervisor. Now when we do have to move a load by hand, then make sure you do some proper things to avoid any type of injury such as a back injury. Squat and keep your back straight and do not bend from the waist. Hold the object as close to your body as possible and lift by straightening your legs. When changing direction, turn with your feet and not with your back. Protect your hands and fingers from rough edges and sharp corners and metal straps. Keep hands and fingers out of pinch points between the load and other objects. And always wear safety gloves as required when handling materials and equipment. Severe hand lacerations and punctures are a common hazard in construction industry. Now let's talk about one of the most hazardous operations in construction and that is excavation. It has the highest fatality rate in construction, outnumbering all types of other fatalities such as falls and other incidents. As a result, all excavating and trenching must conform with established safety standards. These standards are developed by OSHA for the prevention of serious injury and death and may be enhanced by your state's OSHA entity. Excavations have several risks. The greatest one is a cave-in. Cave-ins usually occur without warning and can occur in any depth excavation. In fact, most accidents in excavations occur in trenches from 5 to 15 feet in vertical depth. Other potential risks include asphyxiation due to lack of oxygen, inhalation of toxic materials, fire, collapses caused by moving machinery near the edge of the excavation, and unintended severing of underground utility lines. Employees are best protected through the proper use of sloping, shielding, and shoring the excavation. So there, there's some basic rules in excavation. The first one is, is that all excavations must be sloped to the angle of repose except in solid rock. In its most simplest definition, the angle of repose is the angle of pile of earth or rocks or sand, the angle that it forms with the ground. It is the maximum angle at which the slope of pile is stable and is determined by the shapes of the, of the particles, their cohesion and friction. The second thing is, is materials including the excavated earth, must be placed at least 20 feet from the edge of the excavation. Precautions must be taken to prevent any materials from falling into the excavation. 
Thirdly, trenches four feet or deeper must be shored or sloped back to the angle of repose. Any excavation in unstable soil will require shoring or sloping. Where vehicles or equipment operate near excavation or trenches, the sides of the excavation must be shored or braced as required to withstand the force exoded, exerted by the superimposed load. Also, stop logs or other substantial barricades must be installed at the edges of such excavations. An OSHA certified component person must be at each excavation site at all working times. OSHA certified personnel for excavations and soils must be on site. If evidence of cave-ins or slide-ins is apparent, all work in the excavation must cease until necessary precautions have been taken to safeguard employees. Safe access must be provided in all excavations by, leans of, by means of ladders, stairs, or ramps. Trenches four or more feet in depth must have ladders space so that employees Lateral side-to-side -side travel does not exceed 250 feet. Such ladders must extend at least three feet above the grade level. In locations where oxygen de deficiencies or concentration of ha hazardous or explosive gases or dust are possible, the atmosphere in the excavation must be tested prior to the start of the work and at regular required intervals. When such con conditions exist or may develop, Emergency rescue equipment must be kept readily available and appropriate PPE must be used. Sewers, ditches, and underground utility compartments, pits, and closed tanks, and other confined locations must contain, may contain hazardous vapors or insufficient oxygen. Protection against exposure to such hazards must be provided by ventilation, such as blowers, fans, and then also respirators or controlled exposure time, such as a supervised exposure. Air samples must be required periodically and or prior to entering the confined space. Always check with the supervisor before entering and never work alone in such conditions. When it comes to electrical safety, first and foremost, electricians are the only workers on the job site who are actually authorized to repair electrical equipment. All temporary electrical wiring should be installed and maintained by electricians in ordinance with applicable codes. When it's necessary to work on energized lines and equipment, rubber gloves, blankets, mats, and other protective equipment are generally used. Energized wiring in junction boxes, circuit breakers, or panels or similar practices must be covered at all times. More applicable to the plumbing industry, it is critical that all electrical tools and equipment are grounded. All damaged and defective tools must be returned immediately for shop to be repaired by a qualified repair technician. Here's some basic electrical rules. Temporary electric cords must be covered or elevated. Splices in electrical cords must, be, must retain the mechanical and dielectrical strength of the original cable. Temporary lighting must have guards over the bulbs. Hazardous areas must be barricaded and appropriate warning signs should be posted. Extension cords must be kept in good condition with no cuts and with grounding plugs still attached. Do not directly touch a person receiving an electric shock. And make sure that all ground equipment, and that all equipment is grounded. If an energized wire or component shorts to the case, it will be danger to anyone touching it. When working with electric meters around live power circuits, keep in mind the following. One, replace the original fuse with a correct fuse. Never bypass fuses. The voltage and amperage rating of the fuse are important to protect the circuit. Always use the correct test tool for the job and replace the meter on the correct setting. Always use a properly rated multimeter. When working on a live circuit, as is sometimes required to find the problem, try to keep one hand free. Always use proper lockout and tagout procedures and routinely inspect your test leads. 
Lockout and tagout include specific procedures that protect employees from the unexpected ener energization or startup of machinery and equipment or the release of hazardous energy during the service or maintenance activities. A basic logout and tagout procedure requires that an authorized employee turn off and disconnect the equipment from its energy source before service or maintenance is performed. Lockout or tagout the energy isolating device so that it cannot release hazardous energy and then follow a procedure to verify that the energy has been isolated effectively. When it comes to ladder safety, ladders are appliances usually consisting of two side rails joined by regular intervals by cross pieces called steps, rungs, or cleats. And these are which a person may step while ascending or descending a ladder. There are variations called straight ladders, extension ladders, and step ladders, as well as a variety of special ladders designed for specific uses. When it comes to ladder safety, always face the ladder when ascending or descending. Before climbing, ensure that shoes are free of mud, grease, or other substances that could cause you to slip or fall. Do not carry anything while climbing or hold the la and, and hold the ladder with both hands. Always keep both feet on the rungs. Climb down and reposition the ladder as often as necessary to avoid overreaching. Never stand on either of the top two rungs of any straight or extension ladder while working. Tools and equipment should never be hung from or placed on the rungs of any ladder. Tools and equipment can be drawn up using a hand line. Step ladders should be used only in the fully open position. They should be set level with spreaders fully locked. Workers may work from the top platform of a step ladder only if it's equipped with a railing. Step ladders more than 10 feet in height must be secured or held by another worker. Metal letters must not be used for electrical work or in areas where they could be contacted with, a, with an energized wiring. The use of metal letters is restricted to special applications where the heavy wooden letters are not practical. And then do not exceed the weight limits posted on the side of the ladder. Scaffolding should, should be substantially constructed, stru constructed to carry the loads imposed upon them and to provide a safe working platform. Only approved scaffolds should ever be used. Barrels, boxes, and other makeshift substitutes should never be used. When it comes to proper scaffolding use, guardrails, midrails, and tow boards must be installed on all open sides of scaffolds 10 feet or more above the floor. Scaffold planks must be at least a 2 by 10 piece of lumber, scaffold grade or equivalent. Scaffold planks must be cleated and must extend over the end supports at least 6 inches and not more than 12 inches. All scaffolds must be at least 2 planks wide. The scaffold planks must be visually inspected before each use. Scaffolds must be tied to the building or structure at intervals that do not exceed 30 horizontal feet and two feet vertically. Do not overload scaffolds. Scaffolds must be loaded in excess of one-fourth of their rated capability. When persons are required to work or pass under a scaffold, a screen of 18-gauge two-wire mesh is required between the tow board and the guardrail. Overhead protection is required if employees work on scaffolds are exposed to overhead hazards. Such, prote such protection must be a two inch plank or equivalent. On rolling scaffolds, caster brakes must be locked when the scaffold is not in motion. And finally, let's talk about motor vehicles and heavy equipment. All motor vehicles and heavy equipment must be operated and maintained in conformance with established OSHA standards. Equipment must never be operated beyond its rated capacity, which is posted on rating plates on the equipment along with recommended operating speeds, special hazard warnings, and other essential information. When it comes to safe motor vehicle use, the parking brake must be set whenever the vehicle is parked. Equipment parked on an incline must have the wheels locked. Safety belts must always be used. Do not ride in the bed of a truck. All personnel are prohibited from riding on loads, fenders, running boards, tailgates, and with legs or arms dangling over the sides. Drivers must not move vehicles until riders comply with all safety precautions. Do not back up any vehicle or equipment when the, 
when the view to the rear is obstructed unless it is equipped with an operating backup alarm audible around the surrounding noise for a distance of 2,000 feet or responsible observer signals that it's safe to do so. And that completes the session on safety. Please study the safety PDF presentation as much as needed, and then when you're ready, take the safety quiz. Good luck.